to be working on this illustration. It is a submission for ALAC, that is the Librarians Conference. And uh, part of the requirement for applying as an artist who wants an artist alley table is that you have to submit some literacy themed art for their auction. And when I did ALAC in 2015, I did this really cute illustration of Kara and Tanner playing in a pop-up book. So this year I thought that it would be really sweet to do Kara reading to Pancake since reading, I always used to read to my cat Midnight. And I know that reading to animals can be very soothing for them and help build a bond. Even if they don't understand what you're saying, they definitely seem to, under to appreciate and understand the affection and the attention. So I thought it would be a really nice submission to go in that route. So I went ahead and printed my blue lines out on Kilimanjaro 300 pound watercolor paper. This is a cotton rag watercolor paper. And I'm just going to go ahead and pencil my illustration. My next step, now that this is all penciled, is to figure out whether I want to proceed as this or ink it. Where I am with this is I was able to have an interview or rather a portfolio review with an editor at Scholastic and she was much more enthusiastic about my inked watercolors than she was about my penciled watercolors. And I kind of render differently depending on the style. You guys can check out this link here to see what my penciled watercolors look like. You can check out this link in 15 seconds to see what my inked watercolors look like. You guys can probably see that they're a little bit different. Uh, so what I want to do is I'm actually going to take a picture of this and ask some people what they think, get some perspective, uh, give myself time to think about it because I, since I just finished penciling it, I might be a little bit too close to it. So, I am going to do just that. Hey guys, so I put a t poll up on Twitter and the overwhelming response is that people thought this would look better as an inked watercolor illustration. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to ink it with some waterproof brush pins. 
a Sakura Pigment FB, Sailor Rio Fuka, which has a small side and a large side. So I'm gonna go ahead and ink it in time lapse. This has had plenty of time to dry. I'm gonna go ahead and erase all the graphite. You can kind of barely see it because I inked pretty tight to my pencils. They're good pencils. Um, but I do wanna remove that excess graphite. And then I'm going to stretch this, even though I'm painting on 300 pound watercolor paper, I'm going to go ahead and stretch this. That way there's no rippling, no buckling when the finished piece is dry. So I'm gonna do all of that off camera. All right, art nerds, we've got this stretched and ready to go. The first step we're gonna take is we're going to apply a wash and I'm going to be using my mixed palette that includes Windsor Newton, Holbein and Daniel Smith watercolors as well as a couple of Magello watercolors. So, and I may end up pulling out my other sets as well. So I hope you guys enjoy. I need to select a color that's gonna work well for this wash. And I have a, I think I wanna go for something warm and cheerful. So I think I might even go for like a really light orange kind of thing. So I'm gonna mix some new gamboge and I haven't even activated these uh, pans yet. And that just means putting some water on them and a little bit of scarlet and maybe a little alizarin crimson, just so it has like a warm kind of feeling to it. There we go. And I actually don't have a whole lot of wash mixed up. And then I'm just going to go, hopefully that's enough. I'm just gonna go ahead and tone it. 
and then I'm gonna use a paper towel to dab the excess out of carrot seeds. And off the pages of the book. And I'm working with Kilimanjaro 300 pound paper, cotton rag paper. And you guys have seen me work with this when I did that Kara freaking out over pancake being a, in a stack of pancakes illustration. So you've seen me use this paper before. I really like it. It's nice, heavyweight cotton rag paper, but very affordable because it is Cheap Joe's store brand. Handles really well. I even like how it takes ink, so it's a good paper for illustrations like this. All right, so I'm gonna let this dry. All right, so the tone has already had a chance to dry. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna start blocking in large fields of color. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some water to my daisy palette, like so, very easy. And I'm gonna start with the carpet. So in Naomi's house, the carpet is normally kind of a light blue color. So I think I'll just go ahead it's like a blue gray. I'm gonna go ahead and go with that. Maybe even overfilled. And it's not necessary for this to be consistent with the comic since this is kind of a standalone illustration. But if it's consistent with the comic, then I can maybe use it in promotional art. So to begin with, I'm just gonna start doing a simple fill of color so that means everything gets kind of a layer of color on it. Well, not everything, but all of the carpet is gonna get a uniform layer of color. And I'll add details as I go along further. I have an area in here which is not clearly defined as what was carpet and what is pancake. So I'm just gonna kinda use my best judgment. And there we go. We have a basic fill. I'm going to go ahead, pour my, uh, pour water into the palette for my next color and start thinking about what I want to render next. And since I poured, you guys can't see it, but since I poured too much, I'm just kind of scooping it in to the next palette well. Okay, so book pancake or pancakes bed. Let's start with pancakes bed. And I'm gonna do the interior and I want it to be kind of a, like a buff color, I think. So I'm grabbing several different yellow ochres and I'm gonna do the same to the inside of the bed as I did to the carpet. And from here on, other than set colors, I'm going to pick colors that will complement and work with the two colors we've already established. And since this is cotton rag, it is gonna take a little bit longer to dry. Okay, these are both fairly dry. I'm gonna start mixing up the base color for pancake. That's the cute little cat right there. Well, big cat for this illustration. And even though he's a black cat, I like to start off light and work my way dark. So, that is very Payne's gray. So I'm really gonna have to work in some more black as I paint him. And I'm kind of just doing a fill here to help establish what colors I wanna use. And the paper is still damp. So I'm not really doing a whole lot of adjacent areas right now. Go ahead, clean my brush out, bring some of that color up into the inside of his ear. Do the same over here. These are gonna end up being toned pink a little bit later, but I like establishing a light shade of gray there or black since it makes it feel more coherent with the rest of the cat. A 
blocking in these large areas of color will allow me to make informed decisions about small areas of color like her dress which doesn't yet have a set a set color or even the illustrations used in the book now since this is an illustration for a librarian convention I want to draw attention to the fact that they're looking at a book so I'm gonna do something that kind of contrasts with the other colors used done with that first layer of gray. I'm really glad I decided to respect the vote and do the inked line art because it's going to look really cute and it's going to pop a little bit more I think. All right so I just have one well one two major areas to fill. So that's kind of a base color for the book. I think I'm gonna use kind of a neutral sort of light blue and that way I can paint other colors on top of it. Ah! Only real problem with the Soho watercolors that I use sometimes and I'd actually used some of the Urban Blue Violet is that if you dry them out in a half pan sometimes you'll get chunky bits. You guys can't really see it, but I can see it and it is very disappointing. But I love the color so much. It's my one of my favorite blues to use, so I can't I don't can't bear to take it out of the palette. But it's really frustrating when it does that cuz then it'll like streak and smear. It's like why? So what I'm going to do with the book is I'm going to actually color render the the pages as like undulating masses and then I'm gonna paint the illustrations on the pages after I've kind of toned the pages and what that will kind of do is that will kind of better indicate the forms of the book I just added a little more neutral tint in made it a little darker and I'm just kind of brushing it in now, wet into wet. So we've got a lot of blue right now. I kind of want to do something green. So maybe have her wear something red or brown and then maybe have the inside of the cat bed be kind of, um, I'm actually going to do an underglaze of light, the same blue I used do that inside the cat bed and that's going to help neutralize it because right now it pops a lot and I'm just kind of using a scrumbly stumbly motion because it's got that like soft fleece so this kind of helps imply that there we go that tones it down a little bit but I can let this dry and come back to it and decide in a few minutes all right now that our first layer has kind of dry I can start blocking in the next one and one of the reasons I like to work this way is because I have found that if I apply saturated color details for example and I haven't finished blocking in an area then the like it basically the area being adjacent to something where I'm putting down a lot of water it'll bleed into it and sometimes ruin or require significant corrections so I find it's just easier to do the, some of my blocking and shading at this stage okay, use some of that contrast building I demonstrated in my light and contrast tutorials so it's gonna be three layers and I can also put some more color down on the carpet so long as it doesn't touch a still wet area and I don't want to fill everything in I want to leave some areas a little lighter fill in back here and that'll help create some depths we 
only have a little bitty area like that. So now I need to decide on what color I want to make his cat bed. And I think since we're trying to push the focus forward, something kind of desaturated, maybe a blue would be a good choice or even a purple, just something that isn't going to pull the focus away. Now the problem is we went with cream for his interior bed, which is, I mean, that's what you would see. So that might create contrast between the cream of this and the cream of this, which might generate more interest than what's going on in the foreground because there's stronger contrast in the background. So that's something to think about before we're jumping too far in and picking color. Now this layer has dried, so I'm gonna go ahead and do my last layer of contrast. So, oh, I thought it was dry, but apparently not. That's okay, not actually a big deal. So I think as long as I dress her in something bright and this down here is something bright and unusual, like green, I can probably do purple up here because his eyes are green, his collar is red and gold, and then I need to decide on colors for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up a blue-purple. So I'm going to mix in that blue-violet, some dioxane purple, and we're going to have a lot of dark colors in the background. Well, not dark, but kind of muted colors in the background. So hopefully we'll get our desired effect of depth. So I'm going to start by filling in the cat bed. Now you may find that it's most helpful for you to fill in the areas or to paint the areas, begin painting the areas where you want the viewer's interest to be. I've done it that way and it can be very helpful because then you just need to make sure everything else is it as interesting as what's going on in the foreground and that can be reducing the level of detail, that can be using more muted colors, that can be very wet. Using darker colors, that can be using monochrome, monotone colors in the background. So we've got that filled in. I think it's looking pretty good so far. Now to let those dry. We've got the cat bed blocked in. I actually want to go a little darker purple with that just because right now everything is kind of the same tone and my concern about contrast with the inside of the cat bed is pretty spot on and honestly darkening it will probably increase the contrast. I probably should have done a light blue but I didn't want the background to be entirely monochromatic. Now, I really like the color it is now, but it's gonna dry lighter because that's watercolor. So I will probably end up having to do another layer or two to get it to the color I want it to be, but it's close. So I'm gonna add some texture on the inside of the cat bed. And that's also gonna help tone down some of that color neutralized some of that color since we're using kind of a blue. I also want to mix the carpet color a little bit darker. So I'm gonna grab some Payne's Gray, a little bit of purple, cause that was in there. And a little bit of Urban Blue Violet. And once these things have a chance to dry, I'll go ahead and work on that. Out a little. And we definitely want the carpet to be darker than the book. And right now, they're almost the same color, and it's a problem because the book needs to read as an optical white. So even though we shaded it, and I can probably go in a little later and add um, some highlights to it. 
it's reading is kind of dark right now. So coloring, giving the carpet another layer, making it darker is going to help with some of that perception. Something I really like about these little inked standalone images is they don't have to be worked as much as say a pencil illustration or definitely a comic page. So they move along really quick. You can get a lot done and the line work adds some contrast as well. So you don't have to do as many layers of like developing color as you might with a pencil illustration. It also, they also tend to read very clearly, which is, which is nice. Actually, that purple dried okay. Maybe I can just progress from there. So what I'm gonna do right there, I'm gonna clean out my brush, and sort of soften that transition a little bit. I think it's moving along quite nicely. So while that dries, I'm gonna grab some yellow ochres that have a little bit more brown in them and use these up here. Oh, it's still wet. Made this into a little bit of a mess. Hopefully I can fix that a little bit later on. And then we'll go into the book and just, I know I was just complaining about it being too dark, but there's certain areas that do need to be a little darker still. Now you don't wanna to get too, too far into your watercolor um, without you know starting some of the other segments. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix up Kara's skin tone, which I usually use yellow ochre and a little bit of scarlet. And I'll check if anything, yeah, there's wet right there. So, I'm gonna actually do Pancake's eyes first. And then also a little bit of water down alizarin crimson and do the insides of his ears. So since this has had a chance to dry a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna paint the insides, do the shadow color on Kara's eyes. So I'm using a very light blue and I'm watering it down even more. And this is important to do it before you do the skin, or I think it's important to do it if you can before you do the skin tone because it's much easier at this stage than it is later. And then using a thirsty brush, I'll just absorb the rest of the water. All right. And then, oh, his eyes are still wet, so I can't do anything with that. And we're still waiting to see what happens with the bed. It's kind of a in between waiting stage, but we can go in again and add another layer of color to this carpet. And I don't want it to be overly rendered because then that's not, not as interesting. It's not a focal point. It's not anything that's actually that important. Just opted to render some of the strands of carpet so that it would give more of a scale. Sometimes when I'm painting, I start feeling really frustrated because it's like, oh, everything's damp. Can't even put my hand down. Of course, that's one of the plus sides slash downsides of using something nice like a watercolor paper here, or a cotton rag watercolor paper. So you got my hand in his eye, but there's plenty of color, so it didn't even negatively affect it. 
just makes it a little harder to work, especially to work like this since unfortunately this illustration is almost flat down on the table, which isn't good. You do want to kind of prop it up some and use a little bit of water to blend some of that out. Then I'm going to start at the bottom. And I've just got kind of like a chunky stroke motion, like a heavy stroke. Very similar to how I paint grass, but if I were painting grass, I would try to taper the ends more. These are like blunt little, little strokes. And then carefully. And then back up here. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's see if I can blend some of this out a little bit so it doesn't look like an awkward transition. There we go. All right, so let's give that a chance to dry and then we can check in on it again. Okay, so part of what the problem is back here is that I've lost some of the contrast that I was building up. So I'm gonna fix that a little bit. Do some wet into wet. And then I'm gonna do another layer on the purple. And that should be good enough for that. So one of the nice differences about painting your inks is you can be a little bit looser and it won't have a negative impact. It won't look as sloppy as if you were that loose with pencils. So it can be a lot quicker to paint your inks than it is to paint your pencils. I mean, when you paint your pencils, you're saving yourself a step because you don't have to worry about inking it, but it means you have to go a lot tighter. a little bit of brown. Kind of dab it in here where there would be like a cast shadow and then also maybe down there. And do some wet on to dry so it's a little more stark and defined. Hopefully that'll work out. All right and while all that dries I think I can finally do the first fill on Kara skin. I'm gonna have to switch over to something a little bit smaller brush wise. This brush has a blunted tip. It's good for fills, but it's really terrible for fine details. There's something in the brush that's making it not quite the right color, which is a shame because I started on her face. Sometimes it's even a little frightening how fast some of these illustrations can come together. I need to decide on something for the mouse. I think I'm gonna go with white. So all I'm gonna do is paint the shadows and then maybe like pink ears. Okay, so I'm having trouble getting pancake dark enough, so I'm going to use some antique black and mix that in. I think that'll do the trick. And at this point, everything is very damp, so it's really hard. It's probably time to like set this aside for the evening, give it a chance to dry, come back to it tomorrow. That way I'm not constantly putting my hand in wet paint. Are you guys good at telling your limits? I have a problem where I will push, 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 push. As long as I can, I will push and then I get burnt out. And it happens a lot. I am burnt out most of the time. And that's not good at all. It's actually terrible. And I hope you guys have more sense than I do. And I hope you have more fun activities that you can kind of use as like a, a B activity. So you're not working always on just work. I mean, drawing and painting, they are lots of fun, but they shouldn't be the only fun you have. 
What's even sadder is that when I put this away, I will probably work on something else art related. But at least it will give this painting a chance to dry and be ready for a whole new day. This is a really good base coat for him. My problem, I always use um, like Payne's gray, blue grays, indigo, etc., in painting his base color. And he always ends up coming across as gray instead of black, like in chapter five, no, six. He really reads as gray many times and not black. And it's kind of like when you're mixing light reds, light shades of reds, there's some that look more pink and some that look more like a light red. I think blacks and grays are very similar. I always want there to be other colors when I mix black because black is kind of, depending on which kind of color theory you're going through for, whether you're doing light or whether you're doing color, so additive or subtractive. Um, black is either a complete absence of color or all of the colors mixed together. So I like using other colors when I mix up black tones. So you'll often see me use like an indigo or a dark red and do a toned black so that it has a little more life to it than just straight out of a tube black paint. Oh, see, and some of the black bled out in too, because it was still wet. It still drew some of the paint up. I'm not going to be concerned about that because there's not a whole lot that can be done about that right now. That's kind of what you get to when the paper has hit its saturation for the time being. It takes longer to dry. So I'll take that as my sign that it's time to, time to wrap it up and give everything a nice chance to dry out. All right, I think I'm gonna do another layer or two on Kara's skin before I call it an evening, just cause I've got the color mixed up and it's already pretty decent, pretty close to what I want. So I hate for it to go to waste. And as I rest my hand very gently, on his flank. It's very cool to the touch of damp. Uh, I'm using 300 pound watercolor paper, so it's wicked a lot of the, the water off of the surface, but that doesn't mean it's fully dry. You can do layers on top of that, but you are kind of limited to how many layers you do because you can only saturate the paper so much, which is already what I've kind of done up in this area. We'll also go ahead and do another layer on the little white mouse. And like I said, we're really just painting the shadows. This ended up getting a lot darker then I think I'd planned on it originally getting this background element, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because as I rendered it, it became less saturated, so less contrasty. Adding a little extra texture in there. I think we're good on that. Going to add, let's see, so this is a round shape. You need to think about the shape as it curves away from the light. And we're also probably going to need to do some blending. So that's where I'll say it stops. And then here. And from there, clean the brush, dry off the brush. Blend, blend, blend. And then just a little bit 
We don't want the carpet to get too dark, but it is important to work in some shadows. So. And I don't want to touch the purple because it'll leach out, so I gotta be careful. Or patient. Which do you guys think I'm capable of? You answered neither. You know me too well, you've been watching too long. And then also do some within the jingle ball, and that way it'll look like there's carpet behind it. And then I'm gonna blend some of this out just a little. And soak some of that up. All right, looking good. The cat bed's actually looking a lot better. I was concerned about it. Okay, let's go ahead and do another layer of purple. Blend that out. And over here by our soft boy, we'll add a little shadow. Blend that out also. Oh, that's a shame. His eyes are going to be really pretty, but they're still damp. And right there in the crease. And right there under and inside the ear. I'm just sort of thinking about what I'm going to have her wear because I want it to kind of pop and help her stand out. But I also want to keep in mind that I want the book to do the same thing. And I don't want to use the same colors. Her skin's gonna need to evaporate a little bit overnight, and that way we can get a darker tone of the same color. So we wanna start building up our contrast there so that everything is kind of distinct and stands out and has form. All right, I think I know what colors I wanna use. Era. Now she normally wears really natural colors, so I'm gonna mix up a nice sort of brick red, the same as I used for the interior of Naomi's kitchen in chapter seven, or very similar to, and then she'll wear a lighter color top. That is actually a really pretty red. And although it's still damp, like cool, damp to the touch, not like surface damp, I'm gonna go ahead and add another layer. Now it's so tempting for me to go cartoony painting when I've done inked line work, especially now that I'm playing with this red, it's like, oh, I wanna go cartoony so bad. Which I mean, I could, that is definitely an option available to me. I'm gonna use some really bright green gold here at the bottom of the page. I just realized I missed an area that needs shading on here, so I want to get back to that. And in the green gold, I'm gonna st start out by sketching in some hunter green shapes. Then over here, I'm gonna do nice bright yellow. And in that, I'm gonna do, I think, some maybe, hopefully saturated multicolor shapes, which we'll read when I'm finished as flowers. At least that's the goal. So I'm gonna be doing fair bit of wet in the wet. It's looking good so far. It's a beautiful thing. 
about working with these cotton rag watercolor papers is that they really can take a lot of color. Just a little bit of blue, there we go. So we've got, already we've got lots of bright contrast going on on our book, which is where we want to draw the attention. I mean, she's pointing, but we really want to draw the attention. All right, so next, we need to mix up a little bit of the very light pink I want to use for her shirt. So it needs a lot of water to a little bit of a lizarin crimson. You still wet? I bet you are. And I like alizarin crimson as a pink because it's a little bit bluer and it's also a little bit earthier, I guess. Like, um, it doesn't feel as intense and synthetic as, say, cherry, Holbein's Cherry Red does or um, most scarlets are very red-orange. So it's actually a nice lighter pink, well, lighter red, when you water it down. So these flowers have had a chance to dry. I'm just gonna tighten up a few of them. Just really simply, even a little bit of detail ends up making things like that look much more, I wouldn't say realistic, but fleshed out, believable, convincing. And I don't mind if my colors blend into each other a little bit. All right, I'll let those dry. All right, my dears, this has had time to dry for 24 hours. Our paint have had a chance to evaporate a little bit. So I'm gonna go get a clean cup of water, clean out some brushes and get right back to you. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'll zoom in a little bit for you guys, is I am gonna start working on Kara's skin tone. And this has had a chance to evaporate overnight, so it's a lot darker. See, we got some contrast going, nice. It's a lot more saturated than it was yesterday, but it's still the same color. So this is, if you have the time, this is one of my favorite tricks and it also kind of forces me to step back, let everything have a chance to dry out, but allowing my colors to evaporate overnight means I end up getting an intenser version of the color without having to worry about color matching. And is this an appropriate layer color? Is this actually going to work? Because all the work ends up finished for me. Well, not all the work, but that aspect, which is a really challenging aspect for me. I will often ruin colors unintentionally. So it's a good solution. Okay, then I'm gonna wanna start to tighten up her shirt and I'm gonna wanna start to tighten up her, gosh, there's so many, so many things. So I'm gonna fill, oh, you guys didn't even see the hack I just did. I was so lazy. All right, let me see if I can move this. I just squirted my water brush, which was full of clean water, directly into a pan. So no, no mess, no spilling, super easy. And I've got my watercolor palette here so I can go ahead and start mixing up the colors I'm gonna want. Now I'm gonna mix up a nice, skin tone, shadow color, so permanent mauve, naphthamide maroon, a little dioxine purple. So I need a little bit of a darker color for her shirt. So we can start adding shadows, so a little more alizarin crimson, 
and we're gonna try it and see. Hopefully it's not too dark. It's a little too dark. That's why it can be handy to start in the darkest area of shadow. Now, we also have to keep in mind that watercolors, as I've said many times um, in this video, watercolors will often dry lighter. So another thing you can do is you can go ahead and apply your shadow. And if it looks too dark, just apply it in like the darkest area and let it dry and then see how that's gonna look. Probably did myself a little bit of a disservice, in fact, by blending it out, because it's probably a good saturation. All right, next step, I think, and I'm gonna have to really finagle this, is to do another layer of color here on our good boy pancake. So I've got a nice base color down. It's time to start refining the areas of shadow on him. And I'm gonna dual wield my brushes. Fortunately, that's already had a chance to dry. So as I applied that, I ended up using most of the black that I mixed up for his first. So I'm gonna have to mix up another batch of that, which is fine because as I work subsequently darker, I use fewer of the colors that we use to tone his fur and more of just plain black. So I'm just gonna use more of that Iridori antique black in future layers. All right, so let's put some further work into this grass. Grab in some Hunter's Green. And this would be a really good opportunity to mask this off because it's going to require a fair bit of control. And not that there's anything wrong with control, but it would be quicker if I had masked it. I think that's going to be a good contrast because we've got the green of the grass contrasting with Kara's reddish outfit. And it's kind of a light red, so it's not, hopefully, Fingers crossed, it's not like in your face, um, directional. Subtle, subtle is the word I'm looking for. Unlike me, I hope it's subtle. Works, but is subtle. I'm gonna grab some more of that red brown. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's like maybe I should do the shadow color on her pants and then go ahead and do the red brown top. So I'm actually gonna clear that out. And I'm debating between whether or not I wanna keep work in the background or if I wanna switch over and start tightening up Kara. I could really go either way. I think though, I'm gonna spend a little more time developing the background. So I'm gonna mix up that dark blue, well, the blue from the other night. It's a dark blue now. Just use that in a couple places for shadow. This is coming along quite nicely. So the show I'm painting this for, I actually had two ideas and I like them both so much that I'm actually developing both of them all the way to completion. So we'll see which one I end up going with. I hope you look forward to seeing the other idea I have that'll be up soon. And that way, even though I'm putting in 
kind of twice the work, I'm gonna hopefully have both a nice illustration for them to auction up and a nice illustration for me to sell. And then I'm going to use the same, I'll actually rotate it so you guys can see what I'm doing. I use the same trick I used earlier. In fact, I'm squeezing it over the brush and that way I'm kind of salvaging some of the color from that. Tricky, tricky. Well, cheap, cheap, really. And then, just gonna kind of mix that in. Give that a chance to mix together and get all the extra that's now goopy, I know. Probably not the actual way to do it, but it gets the job done. Anyway, I'll give that kind of a chance to meld together. And then I'm gonna mix up that purple again. It's gonna be much darker now. Just testing to see if pancake is still damp. It's definitely the plus side of letting it dry overnight is that since there's less water in the paper, it doesn't take nearly as long to dry, of course. If I'm not patient and I apply gobs of water to the paper surface, it's gonna kinda create the same situation we were in last night. Blend it out, and I think I've polluted my water so much that I need to go change out my cup of water. All right, I think that has actually dried pretty quickly. A little bit of shadow color there, and also use a little bit of the carpet shadow color, because this is like an intense version of what I usually use for my shadow color on the purple. And that'll just kind of, I can't say desaturate it, but shift the color a little bit, and maybe help imply form. And there's even, there's even an area here I haven't done anything with yet. A little bit on the fur, on the insides of his ears. And then, Oh, good, this will work perfectly, I think, on her dress. Just to do cast shadow. Then also over here, where we're kind of turning away from the light. Oh, yeah, once, once I start adding the shadow colors, things really start to come together kind of quick, which is, Nice, I'm gonna use the darker color. So the same color we use on the carpet to add some shading to her pants. I think when that dries, that's gonna be just perfect. It's always really, really nice for me when I'm doing a little standalone illustration like this um, to be able to utilize colors that I've mixed for other things. Kinda helps pull things together. I'm gonna go ahead and add some water to my yellow ochre so I can start painting his metal. And then catch the inside of the mouse's ear there. Yeah, this is starting to come together really nicely. And I'm gonna go ahead and mix up that shadow tone for her skin. So I'm gonna use the naphthamide violet or no, naphthamide maroon, which is like a really nice kind of darker red violet. Permanent mauve. And I probably won't even use the dioxide, dioxide of purple. But I want to give everything a chance to kind of dry so I have somewhere to rest my hand. All right, let us go ahead now. I actually want to use maybe a fine brush for applying shadow and since I'm not sure about the color, I'm gonna add it first to an area that would already be kind of dark. Mm. 
thicken that up a little bit. And then probably have to blend this one out a little. So I'll just go ahead and do that. Yes, like that. This is a good painting. I firmly approve. Good job. In that it has been fun to paint and it is behaving well and I really enjoy this paper. Cheap jo Joe's did an excellent job of this with this paper. We don't even have a Cheap Joe's in Nashville so I have to order it online but that is okay because this paper is worth it. Not that these days, not that that's a big pain in the butt but if you're impulsive like me it's nice to be able to just go down to your favorite local art haunt and spend your your hard-earned coin. I'm gonna be careful not to put too much on our face because I have a tendency and I think it's kind of a bad tendency to like overshadow her face and then it looks muddy. All right, I'm gonna let that dry because I still wanna do the blush on her cheeks. It dried a little less intense, which is perfect. I'm really glad about that. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and use some of the alizarin crimson, same color she's wearing, very watered down, so it's actually a softer pink to apply it might actually even be too soft. I've been using uh, Windsor Smith's Alizarin Crimson from the tube and I find it handles a lot differently than the other Alizarin Crimsons I've used in the past. So I'm still kind of getting used to it. I tend to go too intense with it. Like that happened a lot in chapter seven. And then go ahead and fill in his eyes. This will be a good sort of swatch for the intensity of this. Oh, whoa, that might be too dark. That is very, very saturated and opaque. I'll let that dry and then I'll see. We can go ahead and do another layer on Kara's pants. And do the first layer on Pancake's metal. I guess that would be an ID tag. So what I think... Ugh, I'm so hesitant to use the black as it is because it is a very intense saturated black. What I'm going to have to do is I'm just going to have to handle it in stages and blend, blend, blend because we're not trying to do blackest of black here. So sort of on that note, not really, but kind of, I was just thinking about what is it, black is black, dark is black, and uh, pink is pink, and how it's basically kind of a, a feud. Um, a lot of artists will joke about doing things out of spite, and uh, I've definitely continued on with projects out of spite. Uh, that said, like, if you do things out of spite, there's a good chance that if it's not the right kind of spite, your audience is gonna quickly turn on you, so. For example, part of the reason, it's not even a big factor. Part of the reason um, I started Kara and I still work on Kara, and it's not, like I said, it's not actually like the driving reason, but it's still there is because I'm still really disappointed in comic options for girls. You have some great things like Smile and Drama and Ghost, but you also get a lot, a lot of like stuff that's either like, very action oriented, which is important. There's definitely girls who love action. Or you get a lot of stuff that's like DC superhero girls, but very girly girl. And that's very valid too, but you don't really get anything for girls kind of in between all that. You don't really get a lot for tomboys who aren't necessarily action oriented. You don't get a lot for um, little girls who don't see themselves as like Barbie dolls, you know? So I wanted, it was really important to me to do a comic that has a little girl main character and 
focuses a lot on friendship, but not on like, let's all go to the mall together kind of friendship or uh, the new flavor of the week. We're all gonna study STEM. Let's go to the library together. And also kind of focuses on family and family relationships and family dynamics. So um, in a way it's kind of driven by spite because you know, I'm making this comic that I feel addresses a niche in the market that isn't being served and it gets a good response at cons, but it doesn't necessarily get any sort of a response on a professional level. So part of why I'm sticking to it is a little bit of like spite. I want to show them that they're wrong about that demographic. So in that instance, you know, I'm doing something there is some spite involved, but there's also some pure motives. I really believe in the comic. I really believe in the content. And I really believe having met these people in person and having been this kind of girl myself, I really believe that there are people who want this. So I'm going to keep doing it for that reason. But when your spite is like a feud against another artist, and I know people like drama. I have a friend who has... I don't know if it's a joke or serious has suggested that we have like an, a YouTube feud because people really enjoy watching that kind of drama unfold. But, you know, I respect them too much to say crummy, fake things about them on the internet just for some views. I mean, in a way it'd be kind of fun because it's like play acting, right? Um, and if there was some way we could do it so that it's very clear that we're messing around, but then it kind of also encourages the competitive spirit that people think are like, people, artists being hungry for work and tr hungry to pay their bills and hungry to make rent, that's often used against us. We're often pitted against each other. And I hate, I hate that. And part of it is because I usually come out at the bottom. So of course I hate that. Um, and it's definitely a big part of like the convention scene. I hate that aspect because it's just unnecessarily nasty. And it's a lot of energy wasted on garbage. So I, even though part of it would be kind of fun to role play that, it's also a little sad to think about because it's already so pervasive in most artists' lives. It's not necessarily something I wanna, I wanna do even in jest because I've spent a lot of time trying to train myself out of those nasty, I'm not always successful, but uh, trying to train myself out of those nasty behaviors. I mean, you guys will hear me say a lot of mm, ungenerous things about art supply companies, but you won't hear me say ungenerous things about another artist for the most part, because I don't want to drag anybody else down and we're all just trying to get our bills paid and get our work noticed. And we're all just trying to hang on. I'm getting in a finicky spot here. Okay. We're all just trying to live our lives, you know? So it's not like if you do in what you do, the way you do helps you pay your bills, helps you make ends meet, however that is. And you're not hurting somebody and you're not lying to people and you're not doing something that's destructive to others, then it's not right for me to like judge you or give you a hard time for that because I haven't walked your life, you know, and you haven't walked mine. So doing things for spite, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't publicize it. I was just thinking about that because I would just mention black is black and pink is pink. And a lot of that was kind of done out of spite and I mean it worked and that's great but that's not really my jam I also spent a lot of my time in high school doing dumb things out of spite and trying to get quote-unquote senpai to notice me so like I feel like I feel like I've already spent enough time being that person I don't need to be that person more and that's not a rail at the person who suggested it because they were just trying to help me attract more viewers and I appreciate the suggestion and I appreciate the offer. Because they're basically offering to spend their time and their energy having a fake fight with me so I can be a little more popular. Which is which is generous, right? Like they don't owe me that. 
I guess that would also help them, but I'm about as interesting as a wet napkin. Good luck digging up real good dirt on me. I mean, it exists, but you'd have to go, you'd have to go pretty far back. Okay. Pancake, I think, I think you're coming along pretty well. I was a little nervous because this, the black I'm using is a little darker than I'd wanted. And I know I can kind of blend it out a little bit to get it so that, you know, it's not like <laughs> a black hole on the paper. No, I dipped into his eye a little bit, but I think, I think he's coming along okay. Since he takes up so much space on the picture plane, I kind of want to get him handled. All right, I'll let that dry and we'll see where we are. Okay, so I'm gonna use just a little bitty bit of the shadow color on Kara. Now this is gonna really desaturate things so it should be used really sparingly but I'm using it for cast shadows just here and there. Just to help describe form. Okay, all right, put it away because otherwise I will, I will overuse it. So, want to mix her dress and skin tone a little darker, or blush tone a little darker. So, I'm grabbing some more of that alizarin crimson, but I have to be careful because I have a wet area over here. Hmm. Maybe even a little bit more. And I'm allowing my brush to also do a bit of dry brush because it adds kind of a nice organic element to the painting so that everything isn't so perfect. It's unfortunately a little hard to see. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add a little color to her cheeks and her lips. Hmm. And then I think once that dries, we can start on her skin tone. I mean, on her freckles and her hair. So next I'm gonna go ahead, add another layer. This is a cooler red. I used Scarlet as the base and I'm kind of reinforcing it with Holbein's Cherry Red, which is a really nice, blue red that isn't overly blue. I think cherry is a pretty good descriptor of it. I'm a little bugged because this is so purple. I know I painted it that way, but it's like almost overly perfect purple. So. Then I wanna do another layer on the grass. and let this dry. Well, actually, I still need to do that jingle ball back there. It keeps hiding from me. So jingle balls, you guys have seen them. They're usually very bright colors. I don't want it to be overly distracting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a nice blue green that will hopefully be accurate without being distracting. And I think this is Magello Marine Blue, which is a really nice blue. Then on the inside, I could even paint the ball yellow or something really kind of showy. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a good choice. Cause we've used a lot of warm colors, even like warm blues, warm purples in this. So having a cool blue doesn't make it come so far forward, 
but it still kind of stands out. All right, so we are at the portion of the painting that I always think of as like the big turning point when I can finally start painting Kara's hair. And I use Venetian red as the base for her hair. And the reason it has to wait until almost the end is it's a very opaque color. In fact, I'll move my daisy wheel. It's a very opaque color for what it is. And it has a tendency to leach into other colors if you add water. Um, like, so if I painted her hair and then I did those shadows, it would possibly leach into those shadows and just look really muddy. And it's a nice color, like, it's worth the trouble. It just means changing my operation order of operations around a little bit to accommodate it. And for the inside of the jingle ball, I'll use some low key, hopefully, contrast with that naphthamide maroon. That'll work nicely. And let's see. Go back to mixing up that hair color and we can do our first, first layer. And as you guys can see, I'm leaving the white highlights. I've already started planning in my highlight. And as much as possible, I try to let the brush do the work for me when it comes to adding highlights. Now, I'm using a very soft squirrel brush that makes it a little harder because it's harder to control, it wants to be floppy, but it's really good for like initial fills. Of course, if you look closely, and you guys are zoomed out so you can't see that close, but if you were to examine the finished skin of this, you might see areas where I lost control a little bit using a squirrel hairbrush. And it's not really a big deal. I mean, part of that is the hand of the artist. Part of that is, you know, using traditional media. You can also kind of clean it up a little bit. Or you don't have to use a squirrel hair brush. You can use any sort of brush you're comfortable with using. That's just one of the types of brushes that I really like to use, so. Oh, do I wanna do another layer of pink on her clothing? Or do I wanna do another layer of blue? I think I'll do the blue. Just in the areas that are really in shadow. And the reason I'm doing this now is I'm about to start coloring these little leaflets. So I wanna make sure I get any tricky shading done. And I'm using that darker blue just to kinda of add like a final layer of shadow on her pants. I want to add a little more blush to her cheeks. And then, using that squirrel brush, because it's very soft, I want to do a little bit of a glaze across the top of Pancake's eye. So I'm grabbing some of that marine blue. So it's a very um, yellow, very cool blue. Oh no, too much. Might leave it like that though. It's gonna dry a little lighter than that. I can also lighten it by using a thirsty brush, going over and kind of picking some of that up. Or even blend some of that out a little bit. So I wanna go ahead and add a layer of shadow on his collar. So I'm grabbing the darker blue mix. That's the color we used on the carpet. 
and I'm glazing it on using the soft squirrel brush. See, it's a little bit, a little bit floppy, can be a little hard to handle, but there are some great things that a squirrel hairbrush can do in gently applying glazes so that it doesn't disturb the prior layers and is less likely to cause scraping or muddiness. Gentle glazes is a great reason to have a few squirrel brushes. I'm just kind of looking everything over, thinking about contrast, making sure there's enough of it. This is something I can't always do with carrot pages because there's so many panels on the page. You have to kind of pick your battles. And I do always try to give it my best, but I will sometimes opt not to do quite as much contrast because it might make the whole page a little more difficult to read. But on a standalone illustration like this, it's really nice to be able to go back and tweak and kind of fine tune things. Earlier, I was thinking because some I've been asked a couple times about doing watercolor comics panel by panel, and basically it's a lot, it's a lot like this. I don't have the luxury yet of using really nice paper, so um, there are a few things that I kind of pull back on because the paper I use just isn't really capable of handling that. And then there's also. Um, a few stages I handle in bulk, so, well, most of the stages, in fact, I handle in bulk. So there are some differences, but it's a lot like this. Layer after layer, patience, building up color, looking at the work, checking for errors, checking for, you know, how can I do this better? What needs to be tightened up? Letting things dry. I mean, we're eating elephants in that we're doing everything bite by bite. You're probably looking a little bit ahead to the next step, but not too much ahead. Hmm. Okay, looking good. So I'm gonna let this dry. And of course, then we can continue to develop colors together. Okay, so we can start painting some of these other details. That means I need to decide what color I want. I want the leaves to be the same color, but what color I want this to be. And I think I want maybe something, I don't know. I don't know if I want red. She's wearing a lot of red, but I don't want something that also doesn't go with what she's wearing. So I think I will buy myself some time. I'll stall by painting the leaves. And I wanna give myself, even though I'm doing a tiny detail, I wanna give myself room to build up some contrast. So I'm gonna work with a watered down version of the color. And that way I can go back in and later add more depth. And speaking of depth of color, I'm gonna add a little bit to the jingle ball in the background. I'm going to also go in and darken her foreground arm, not forearm, although that is the forearm, foreground arm. No, background arm, wow, my joke was just a complete disaster. It failed, it does not hold. Just a little bit. So, the area sort of in shadow there. And I like doing this at this stage because since I've added the contrast colors, I can tell what could benefit from a little more of the original color development. All right, leave that be because I have a strong tendency to overwork things. It's something I have to actively fight, in fact. 
Get that little mouse's eye. And do some quin gold on his collar. Not his collar, his ID tag. And if I can get a fine enough point, I think I'll use that red for the button as well. That way it matches, but compared to the leaves, it contrasts just a little bit without totally breaking our color scheme. And I'll leave a little hint of red or white up there. It's getting close to time to do another layer on her hair. Skin's dry. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the freckles. Oh yeah, that's gonna end up bleeding out a little bit. And then give that a chance to dry as well. Okay, so everything's had a chance to dry. Gonna go ahead and pick up some more of that green. Also grab a little bit of the maroon, which I'm also going to use on his collar. And then blend it out a bit because that is a very intense transition. Maybe try to lift it back a little bit here on the button. Now I'm kind of at the point where I can do the next layer of her hair. So I'm going to work a lot more thickly with the Venetian red. This is also when I can do the first layer on her eyebrows. I always feel like the contrast in an illustration that I've done never really comes together until I get her hair painted in. That's when I can really see whether or not I did a good job with contrast or if I need to bump things up a little bit. That's sort of like how I find my illustrations really start coming to life more when I add the white gouache highlights. And water that um, down a little bit. And I'm gonna do a second pass on the freckles. All right, guys, so I am going to go ahead and apply the next layer to her hair. So I am using Van Dyke Brown, which is a nice red brown. And I think in some areas on Pancake, I'm going to go for just another layer of black. But like I said, it's always hard for me to gauge whether or not there's enough contrast until I get Kara's hair all painted. And then I usually have a pretty good idea of what remains to be, what needs more work. Plus the hair usually provides a lot of contrast. So. So I'm going to go in after this is dried with another layer of the Venetian red. Just kind of clean the shine up a little bit. When you guys paint, what is the hardest that can be either challenge or just difficult because it requires manual dexterity or balance that you might lack? What is the hardest thing? for you guys to paint. What makes watercolor challenging for you? For me, overworking is always a concern. It's something I do tend to do pretty often, but also just getting a good enough angle when I'm recording like this 
so that you guys can see, but I can also paint with control is really hard for me. So I'm interested in seeing what you guys are hearing about what you guys struggle with. Always kind of gives me perspective when I see what other people are fighting. So it kind of makes you feel like you're less alone because you're not the only one fighting this battle, even if what you find challenging differs from what I find challenging. Right, I'm gonna grab some neutral tint. Hopefully be able to do this. There, hopefully that'll help. Purple was a little too vibrant. Needed to kind of fade off into the distance there. And I'll use the same color here in the carpet, kind of help round things a little bit, hopefully. So I'm just kind of giving everything the once over, checking contrast, stuff like that. We do need to do another layer on our hair, but I think we're getting close to the point where we can start working with watercolor pencils like Derwent Inktense and White Wash. Which means we're getting close to the end. I feel a little bad because this illustration isn't quite as rendered to like the same level of watercolor detail as the launch illustration is. Not the launch, the pancakes, pancakes. So where the illustration I did recently where he's covered in pancakes and Kara's freaking out. Go ahead and fill that a little bit more and that way hopefully it'll be a little easier to read it. Park back to that nice sunny yellow that we used for the original wash. Okay, so that's had a little bit of a chance to dry. Her hair is still somewhat wet, so we're gonna just let that have more time, of course. But I'm gonna do, let's see, new gamboge will probably work. I think so. Then go back in on her teeth. And it's honestly better if we go a little too dark because we can always use white gouache to kind of lighten it up. Do a little bit of shadow coming from Mr. Pancake there. Maybe add a little more pink to his nose. And that might be a little too much on her lips. So, there, I think that'll work. Yep, it all looks like it's coming along. So I think the only thing we have to finish before we can switch media is her hair. Okay, so we're kind of closing in on the end of today's labors because I want to give this piece time to dry out overnight before I use something like watercolor pencils, which will could abrade a soft surface. So I'm just using a little bit of sepia just to sort of add a final layer of detail to her hair. All right, I think all that's really left for this, other than a couple of touch ups here and there, I think I'm doing right now is to let it dry overnight. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, so this has had a chance to dry overnight. Last night I took a couple notes, more peach saturation to the skin and more paint to the dress. Those are things that I had noticed could be improved upon after I guess I'd stepped away for about an hour or so. That's why stepping away is usually a good thing. It's also why I usually will keep my palette even if I think I'm finished with it. So I need to make sure it's light enough. Okay. 
And if I start to lose the freckles, I'm just gonna reapply them. All right, let that dry and I'm gonna reactivate my alizarin crimson. Now I'm gonna grab a little bit of the alizarin crimson, water it down and apply it to the dress. All right, I'm gonna let this dry and then I think it's time to go ahead and roll out the color pencils. I'm kind of hoping that this is tight enough that I can get away with just using white gouache and white intense color pencil. The nice thing about Inktense color pencils too is that you can use them to gradually build up white since you can blend it back out. See, that's too low, so what I can do, well, I thought I could do it. What I know I can actually do though, and it's because I'm kind of going at it from a bad, an overhand angle, which is not really great. All right, so I have a little pile of wash. It's actually starting to run out, not run out, run dry. So getting a little extra water than I would normally do. This might not be the right size brush for this. Let me switch it out, something a little smaller. All right, guys, I think this is just about done. All that's left is to remove this blue tape, scan it, and set it free into the world. Thank you guys so much for hanging. I say that and then I'm like, oh yeah, I wanted to, isn't that how it always is? Isn't that all my videos? I wanted to tighten up Pancake's eyes a bit because the inks got lost. There we go. Yeah, that actually helps a lot. Do I want to do that with Kara's eyes? Maybe just a little bit. This is my, my perpetual reworking problem. Oh, my hand's shaking a little bit, so it's not, not quite perfect. Yeah. Better, I think, than it was. There we go. Okay. All right. So, let me square this up. We'll say our goodbyes. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me over the past three days while I painted this. It has been a pleasure. For those of you who took time to vote in the poll when I did it, I know by the time you guys are watching this, this is long since passed. I wanna thank you guys for taking a moment to do that. I think this turned out beautiful and I am excited to potentially submit it for ALAC, which is a librarian's conference. And it's gonna be in New Orleans, Louisiana, my hometown this year, so I am excited and I am double excited because seven inch carrot is set in Hanville, which is also in Louisiana. It's about 40 minutes away. So, you know, hometown pride. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful, useful, and informative to you. Uh, I realized I was kind of down key towards the end. It's because I think I'm coming down with something and, um, I had some coffee. So now I'm nice and peppy, but, uh, wasn't, not depression, excited about my work still, just not feeling super great. But 
Thank you guys so much for spending time with me. I always appreciate it. And if you ever have any questions, I know you guys do let me know in the comments. You can continue to do so and I will continue to read them and then not, not always respond. I know, I'm sorry. Ew, I put my hand in gosh. But uh, what I have tried to do in the past is I've tried to hire a friend to go through my comments and like let me know like when people have questions so that I don't miss them and I can actually get to them because even if even when I am good about answering questions I know I miss some of them and having somebody kind of help me moderate would be really handy So if you think this is cute, then you need to head on over to 7inchcare.com or 7inchcare.tumblr.com and read the webcomic. This is Kara. This is Pancake. You guys have seen me draw them before, I'm sure. If you're not familiar with the comic, please go read it. I promise you'll find it enjoyable. If you enjoy this, you'll enjoy that. It is a beautiful all ages watercolor comic about an adorable little girl, her friendship with an equally adorable teenage girl, and the kitten who she gets to ride off into the sunset, something like that. Something, but not quite. So thank you guys for hanging out. Go check that out and go check out my watercolor basic series over on the blog and here on the channel for more great watercolor tutorials. Have a great day guys. And I really look forward to seeing you guys again really soon with another video. Bye.